All right, there you go. <laughs> hey, so, uh, first of all, I'm going to say something that I don't have written down here. I did make notes this time because my previous video where I was explaining my stance against uh, atheism, I didn't have notes and uh, I, I just have so many things to say because I have gone so long uh, dealing with people that don't like deep, long, intelligent conversation, people who will talk for hours on end about a football game, even after it goes off, you know, and love, boisterous, playful conversation, but people who don't really care for any intelligent conversation, or if they do have it, they want to keep it to five minutes or less and get back to the playful stuff. And I'm talking people that are 40, 50, 60 years old, okay? Drives me up a fucking wall that people are like that, you know? And so I've decided to go full force going into 2022, you know, and, uh, and to really just get people out of my life who, uh, just don't want to have serious, intelligent conversation. I'm going to come out against anti-intellectualism in a big way. Um, and so anyway, since there are really no people in my life that like to have long, intelligent conversation, uh, I find myself making a lot of videos because I figure, you know, I don't know when my day will come. Uh, and so, whenever my day comes and I leave this world, you'll have plenty of video of me, uh, and also, I let people know that, well, this yellow <laughs> five-subject notebook, it's got a lot of notes that I made, uh, before making this or that video. I've already gotten all the way through uh, one subject section, and I'm actually most of the way through the second, so almost 80 pages in, uh, <laughs> so that's a lot of stuff that I've been talking about, making videos about since I moved into this place on May 5th, Cinco de Mayo, uh, 2021, uh, I don't know when you're watching this video, but I'm shooting this video on December 28th, 2021, so I've been in this location for over, over five months, uh, and uh, over seven months, excuse me, <laughs> my bad. I've been in this location over seven months, since the fifth month, <laughs> and, uh, and I've had a lot of uh, quiet time, and I do find that quiet time to be, uh, you know, peaceful. I'm, I'm not really lonely, just alone, uh, and I am fed up with so much of how our society thinks and the emotionalism and so forth. So, you know, I, I actually do like the idea of just being able to be alone a lot. Yeah, and, and not have to deal with people's bullshit, people's fuck-ass emotional, irrational ways of thinking. But, but, uh, so, none of that stuff is written down that I just said. Um, but I'm just kind of letting you know where I'm coming from uh, in life as a whole right now anyway uh but yeah so anyway uh yesterday on december 27th 2021 i did a video about being against atheism and began to explain some of what i'd said in a written uh facebook post and where i came out against it and uh i got dozens of uh comments in that thread people were really pissed off uh a certain woman that i'm fond of uh didn't like my approach you know and how public i was about you know just uh what i hold against atheists uh she kind of thought i should have done things in a in a quieter fashion but uh i actually wanted to make a stir and that's exactly what i did uh, and it's all part of a campaign to begin to go hard in 2022 about how people think and uh, making people make sense. I've been frustrated with society's emotionalism for quite some time. 
uh, and how irrational people are. And I said in the previous video how that you have all these conspiracy theorists who believe that Hillary Clinton and other high profile people had a child, uh, child sex slash porn ring operating out of a pizza shop here in D.C. People talking about chemtrails, people talking about lizard people running the world, and, and people who thought that Donald Trump won the 2020 election, you know, uh, all kinds of crazy folk in the world, and uh, you have parents uh, flying off the handle at these school board meetings where they're talking about uh, critical race theory, uh, teaching that, that white people back in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s mistreated black people, enslaving them, and so forth. Okay, and I mean, it is documented in American history, you know, and then Black Wall Street and, and uh, some other stuff as well, you know, Jim Crow, KKK, on and on. You know, and, and so people get emotional and fly off the handle when you bring up documented history as if them getting in their feelings somehow changes what happened 100, 200, 300 years ago. I mean, just, just so much irrational thinking, so much irrational behavior. We had an irrational president in the person of Donald Trump. Uh, and, I mean, Joe Biden has his faults, but God, he is nothing like Donald Trump. He, he is not this He's not the victim of rabid emotion. Uh, he's he's not dealing with very obvious mental illness. Okay, uh, he may be losing some of his faculties, but that's a bit different than just than being crazy. Donald Trump is crazy as fuck. Okay, but but uh, yes. Yeah, so so I, I should go on and jump ahead and say that um, what I hold against. Atheists, well, that's that's basically just a subset of my considerations of how society needs to think differently, uh, and and so I could have started anywhere in terms of cleaning up how people think, but I decided to start there in part to give honor to God, and uh, even though I'm not yet at that point in my notes. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and say that it's not so much that, that atheists have mistreated me. Uh, it's, it's really just a matter of uh, me wondering if God himself is upset about me not pushing away atheists sooner. I've been a firm believer in, in God all of my life. From the time that I was able to walk and talk, I was in church, probably even before that, and just I was just too young to remember. Uh, and I had a very religious upbringing, and then halfway through the eighth grade, I transferred to a Christian school. And for the last half of eighth grade and all of high school, I went to two different Christian schools, one in New Jersey, where I'm from, one in Florida, where, where my family moved when I was 16. Okay, uh, but anyway... It's not that atheists have done me wrong in some way. It's more a matter of me thinking about how God feels. So while you're out there talking about your feelings, I'm thinking about how God feels. And I should also jump over to uh, some other uh, related topics uh, and say that I think about how God feels about gender equality. I think about how God feels about abortion. I think about how God feels when it comes to uh, gay rights, you know, the whole LGBTQIA issue. Uh, and, and so I'm not going to expound on those matters right now, but, and uh, my answers, or uh, my statements, and I'll make it sometime in the future, what I have to say about those things might actually surprise you a bit. But you can go back one video and, and see where I state support for gender equality, even though I don't believe God supports gender equality. Uh, and long story short, what I said in the previous video, and I've said it a number of other times, in other videos and in person and in writing, uh, I, I've said that, oh, <laughs> 
that, uh, you know, I, I support gender equality, but I think God is against it. But I also believe that I'm going to have to uh, answer to God if I can't uh, show that there's at least, at least one woman that I can find that I can say is sufficiently rational. And quite frankly, whether you're a man or a woman, I would say that your rationale is insufficient if you can't wrap your head around the idea that God is a hard God, you know, and that he, that he does necessary evils, okay? And he may even do some evils that aren't, that aren't necessary, just for the sheer pleasure of it, but he does definitely do necessary evils. Okay, and if and if you can't wrap your head around those sorts of things, especially when you look at how fucked up people are in the world, then then uh, there's something wrong with you, and you are insufficiently rational if you're rational at all. Okay, so uh, and I don't give a fuck how you feel about it. You know, the truth is the truth. But but anyway, so now that I've already jumped ahead and said some of what I have written down here without looking at my notes, I'm going to go ahead and look at them and see what else I haven't already covered. Okay, so you see, I, I mentioned the fact that uh, the what I have against atheists is really part of a more general uh, concern around how people think and how our society needs to become more rational and think conceptually. Uh, and uh, let me see. Oh man, I already covered a lot of that stuff. So, let me go ahead and say that uh, I meant to get around to this a little bit sooner uh, because the video I made yesterday, I was 14 minutes in when I began to uh, talk about a certain woman that I am fond of. I didn't call her by name. Uh, she doesn't have to point herself out. Uh, there's probably at least one other person besides her who would be able to look at this video and figure out who I'm referencing. Uh, I'll, I'll try to, uh, make sure that I don't throw too many hints in light of that one person. I don't really imagine anyone else figuring it out from what I'll, what I'm about to say. But, uh, as I got 14 minutes into yesterday's video... I realized that uh, I could highlight a certain conversation I had with this particular woman in order to make a point that I had wanted to make for a long time. And uh, just checking my time here because I do want to see uh, Nightly News with Lester Hall. But and it's 6.25, so I got 35 minutes. But, but um, anyway, I realized... 14 minutes into yesterday's video that, you know, I could use the conversation I had with her some time ago to really make a point that I wanted to make for a long time around conceptual thought. And I've, I've, uh, begun to explain it in a number of instances, but, uh, some, something about our conversation that we had a little while back, uh, really just kind of helps to demonstrate what I'm talking about when I talk about conceptual thought. Uh, because rationale gets a little bit of play, you know, gets talked about here and there. Uh, and people kind of have an idea as to what constitutes rationale, what constitutes rational thought. Um, and they understand that a man's mechanical inclination would help them to understand and first of all invent and then understand things like cars and refrigerators and computers and other machines and structuring society and and complex ways of getting jobs done like uh, the rational planning that it took, the engineering that it took to build things like the Hoover Dam. You know, uh, well, they, they understand that, that rationale is very inventive, that rationale thinks of processes, the processes by which uh, thousands of different types of machines work, the processes by which societies are structured, the processes by which even some of the simpler jobs get done, uh, the processes by which some very uh, complex jobs get done, 
uh, Edmund, the processes by which the body functions and so forth and so on. Okay, so, so rationale gets a considerable amount of play. But you don't really hear people talk about conceptual thought. Uh, about the only time that anyone makes any real reference to conceptual thought is when women are complaining that men compartmentalize everything. Uh, so they don't go all the way there. They just kind of sense that men have a certain part of the male mindset that doesn't set well with women. Uh, and women just kind of realize that they have to tolerate rationale to a certain degree because you got to plan things out. Uh, you can't live life without any kind of planning whatsoever. And even if it wasn't for the rationale involved in a plan, there is the rationale of circumstances wherein if you don't plan, uh, various circumstances will affect you one way or the other, you know, and, and so I think that even when, even when women shut down a man's rational thinking by telling him, don't solve it, just listen, I just want to tell you how the problem made me feel. I don't want to hear your rational plan for solving it. You know, uh, even when they say that, they still realize that some degree of rationale is necessary. But then conceptual thought, you know, like I say, it doesn't get a lot of mention. It doesn't get a lot of play. Uh, and so I really have to build things from the ground up in terms of explaining what it is I'm talking about. So, uh, I'll start off with a real simple explanation and say this, that, uh, well, rationale constructs processes and uh, in individual processes. Uh, this is the process by which we're going to get this done. This is the set of processes by which this machine works. Uh, it, uh, this is the process of events that led up to the current problem. This is the process of, of events we're going to use, ideas we're going to use to solve such and such a problem going forward, and on and on. You know, so you, so you think of this or that linear process. Whereas conceptual thought just kind of takes all these different linear processes and, and just kind of rolls them all together so as to say, well... How did these three or four situations begin? And uh, how did these three or four situations end? And what happened in the middle? And what kind of similarities are there between these several beginnings, these several endings, these several middles? You know, uh, and you look for the similarities and, and uh, then you try to figure out is there some kind of general rule that lies between uh, these different situations, uh, when, you, when you juxtapose these three or four uh, timelines, then uh, what stands out as being a, a commonality? And you can use it to figure out the problem that, that, or how the same problem arose out of those three or four situations. You can use it to figure out how something good uh, came from three or four situations. It doesn't have to be three or four. It can be two. It can be five. It can be six. Okay. However many you juxtapose. Uh, but, but anyway, so conceptual thought just kind of juxtaposes different processes so as to look for the rule of nature, law of nature that lies between them, the law of human behavior that lies between them, the law of physiology that lies between them, and so forth and so on. You know, what is the general law that lies between these several situations that we need to learn uh, and that we need to use to govern our behavior going forward? And, and conceptual thought doesn't just figure out how to deal with one situation going forward. Uh, it, it, it learns a rule or makes a rule that governs multiple situations going forward and that is an important point and the reason I say that is an important point is because I'm about to tell you about this conversation uh, that she and I had. So uh, I do remember the exact day but I'm not going to tell you right here right now the exact day on which this conversation occurred but um, anyway so uh, I did not plan on having a one-to-one -one conversation with this woman on this particular day. Uh, I organized an event 
and uh, that event lasted a couple of hours, and and then uh, and this woman ended up being late to the event. As a matter of fact, we didn't know how long the event was going to last, and I I thought maybe three hours. It lasted about two hours, so she thought she might make it for the last hour. And uh, it turns out less than five minutes after the last person left is when she showed up. And uh, it turns out that there's a little bit of a problem between her and the last person that left. Uh, and, and I didn't know about that problem when I invited both of them. So there's a part of me that was breathing uh, a sigh of relief when I found out about that problem. Uh, and I'm glad that they did not meet in my residence, and I did not have to uh, uh, solve a dispute, resolve a dispute in my residence. You know, I'm not into all that drama, and the nature of the problem just kind of makes it where, you know, I, I really just didn't want to have to deal with that. And so I'm kind of glad she showed up late. But when she showed up late, uh, she and I ended up speaking uh, one-to-one for about 35 minutes, and we had a very fluid conversation. She didn't seem to be uncomfortable at all. She seemed to be pretty candid. And uh, I saw that she had a really good head on her shoulders. I had previously developed a fondness for her. I had, I showed her evidence from several years prior that I had uh, developed a fondness for her. Uh, she, if she sees this, then she'll know what that evidence was. But uh, I don't even recall what the situation was that caused me to develop the fondness for her. But uh, I do know that uh, I was able to find some electronic evidence uh, from several years ago that proved that I had thought highly of her several years prior. uh, And she got to appreciate that evidence when I showed it to her, <laughs> but, uh, and, and we talked about a few different things in 35 minutes, but there was one part of our conversation that really stood out to me, uh, and it was in part because, uh, I thought that maybe, uh, what I said bothered her a bit, um, so, she explained to me that she's been divorced three times. And, and uh, she was very comfortable mentioning it. Uh, I don't remember exactly how it came up in our conversation, but I do know that throughout our conversation that we were both very comfortable, very relaxed, very candid. Uh, and it was the first time that I got to talk with her without anybody else being around. She's a friend of a friend, and that's how I met her. And I'd always previously seen her in large groups, five, six, seven people, maybe not really large, but for a residence, maybe large enough. And and, uh, so I just got a message on my phone that I'm working tomorrow. (laughs) But um, so... I'd always seen her in these larger groups, five or more people, and it was always a boisterous thing, uh, drinking beer and wine and talking shit, you know, that kind of stuff. And I'd never had an opportunity just to talk with her one-to-one in a serious conversation, no drinking, you know, uh, and, and so anyway, I really appreciated this opportunity, even though it happened by accident. Neither one of us planned on having a one-to-one. Uh, neither one of us, you know, planned on having a serious conversation. It just happened, you know. And I think that God may have been behind it, causing it to happen, you know. Uh, and and so, um. <laughs> She, when, when she told me about the three divorces, uh, I asked her, um, so, what drew you to each of your three husbands? And I thought she was going to mention uh, something, you know, that people would generally associate with being a reason to be attracted to someone, a reason to... Uh, 
want to date them and want to marry them. Uh, and she didn't ever tell me what drew her to any of her three husbands. She, she said, well, it wasn't their looks. I wasn't drawn to their looks. And I thought she might actually be flirting with me when she said that. I thought that uh, she might be letting me know that, hey, Eric, you're not a great looking guy, but you stand a chance. But uh, I, I decided not to take it there, to, to keep it 100% serious. And, and I know dating is serious too, but I figured I'd keep it off of the dating tip and just, you know, just have uh, a, a good, friendly conversation with her without uh, bringing anything about dating into that conversation. You know, and and uh, hopefully, you know, me having done that would increase my chances in the future after the making of this video. But but um, so so uh, anyway, I when I asked her what drew you to each of your three husbands, then uh, I had intended on following up by asking her, uh, why did you divorce each of them? And then you know, uh, maybe even asking her about some of the stuff that happened in the middle, thinking maybe this was gonna turn into an hour long uh, conversation just about her three marriages. But uh, it never became that. Uh, after she gave me the answer she gave about how she was not attracted to their looks, uh, I, it, it, something struck me. It, it struck me that, you know, women are always saying men compartmentalize everything. And, uh, and I thought to myself, see, uh, that's my natural tendency to compartmentalize everything. And I was beginning a compartmentalizing conversation, trying to see if we can juxtapose these three marriages figure out how they started, how they ended, what went wrong in between. Uh, and you might figure, well, that's because you, were, you wanted to see if you stood a chance with this woman. Well, it's not entirely a matter of seeing if I stood a chance with her. Now, her telling me that she wasn't attracted to their looks made me think that I might stand a chance with her. But my, the reason for me beginning that line of questioning, and only getting one question in for that matter, uh, was really not for the purpose of seeing if I could date this woman, if I could marry this woman. Uh, but she did show a level of intellect that I appreciate. And in that in and of itself lets me know that it's worth my time to uh, pursue a closer, more meaningful, more intentional friendship. Uh, she and I have not crossed paths all that much over the approximate 10 years since I first met her. Uh, and, and so I have not been intentional about, uh, befriending her. Uh, we've been Facebook friends for a while now, but even after we became Facebook friends, I wasn't really intentional about inter interacting with her. She was somebody I knew, somebody I liked, but not somebody that I really uh, went out, out of my way to contact or to try to date for that matter. But, but uh, anyway, my line of questioning was for the purpose of juxtaposing the three marriages and, and just to see, you know, if together she and I could think through uh, what the commonalities were and, and, and uh, extract some, some sort of lesson. I didn't have any idea what sort of lesson there might, might uh, lie within that conversation. Uh, and for all I knew, um, what she might have told me if we had really continued that part of our conversation, it might have made me think, I don't want to be bothered with her. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, we didn't get that far. Uh, then again, what she might have told me if we had continued down that track might have made me think, you know, I love this woman so much more. You know, I've been fond of her for a while. Uh, she's showing such great intellect even now. 
and I really want to be very, very intentional about being her friend. And then maybe a month or two in, uh, I'll see if we can take it a bit further than that, you know. But uh, so, so it would be incorrect to say that I really wanted to date her. But it would be correct to say that I wanted to see, you know, what else I could learn so as to make a decision on whether or not I wanted to date her. Uh, but there's, there's more, because when you, when you talk about conceptual thought, conceptual thought doesn't just help you uh, plan out one process and not necessarily just two processes. Conceptual thought, once you conceptualize something, once you compartmentalize something, it can help you figure out 5, 10, 20, 100, 1,000 different processes. As long as you just bear this, this or that one rule in mind, you, you may have to bear four or five different rules in mind. Not just rules made by people, but laws of nature. This, this generally have, these types of situations generally start this way and end that way sort of thing, you know. But, but uh, whatever I might have learned uh, might have even assisted me in uh, my interactions with other women, not necessarily just this one, okay? Uh, and I just don't know what uh, I would have learned if that, pro if that conversation had continued, okay? that part of the conversation anyway. And uh, I am getting kind of thirsty, and I do have about 15 minutes before Meet the Press comes on. So let me uh, see what else I haven't already said that I have written down here. Okay, so uh, this woman that I've been describing, or the con this woman uh, who I had a conversation with, in which conversation I've been describing, um, I do know that she is not fond of the approach I've been using for the past few days, coming out against atheists on Facebook. She thought that I should have been, done things on the DL, the down low, that I should have just gone through the contacts that I know are atheists and, and just unfriended them one by one without saying anything. You know, uh, but actually I wanted to make a stir and I wanted to provoke some thought on the issue of atheism. Uh, but that, but my concerns around atheism are a subset of my concerns around how society in general thinks. Uh, and so I should tell you that I've done jobs where I was a freight handler. I've done jobs where I was doing, uh, I've done construction cleanup, cleaning up a lot of construction debris. And I've been in situations where there's so much freight to be hauled or so much construction waste to be uh, picked up that, that you, you can start anywhere. It's just a big mess a big pile of whatever, or you got pallets all over the place and carts all over the place. You know, it doesn't really matter where you start as long as you start and you start to start moving things, you know. And, and so it's that sort of thinking that kind of caused me to say, okay, I can start anywhere in terms of pushing people to think not just rationally, but conceptually as well. Uh, so where will I start? And I decided to give honor to God by starting out, starting out coming out against atheists. So, it's, so one reason that I started with atheists is just because I could have started anywhere. And uh, it's just a big mess. So many carts to move, so many pallets to move, so many piles of trash to move, you know. And so you just pick one and start with it, you know. Uh, and and uh, so that's part of what led into me homing in on atheist. But then I decided that I wanted to give honor to God by starting off coming out against the atheist, you know. And and uh, yeah, but it's not that any atheist has necessarily done anything wrong to me. Uh, I mean, being an atheist, 
uh, you being an atheist doesn't really hurt me, uh, but but it will hurt you in the future on Judgment Day, you know. So and I do wonder if God might already be angry with me for having tolerated atheists up until now, despite my lifelong belief in him and my very religious upbringing and the things that I've learned uh, and the spiritual growth that I've made uh, since becoming an adult. You know, and some people think that becoming kinder means you've done a lot of spiritual growth, but not necessarily, because God is a hard God. Jesus is sweet, but God is a hard God. And Isaiah 45, 7, my favorite verse in the Bible says, I form light and create darkness. I make good and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Okay. Uh, and, and so God is not sweet. And being kind, being sweet is not indicative of you being spiritual, of you being godly. God sent people to war. And in certain instances, God said, kill everything that breathes. Man, woman, child, infant, puppy, cattle, kill it all. Kill everything that breathes. You know, he said the cities that are far from you, uh, you confront the men, tell them to become your tributaries slash servants. If they won't, kill the men. But for the cities that are near on to you, namely the Jebusites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and a few others, kill everything that breathes, including the three-month-old baby, including the pregnant woman, including the little kitty cat, you know, kill it all, you know. And so God is not sweet. I can not overemphasize that. And people have a hard time grasping that. And then when I say that, you know, then, then they say, well, I'm not going to serve that kind of God. You know, well, you should become a bank teller. And tell that robber who has a gun to your head that you're not going to give him the money. You know, see, see how far that gets you, you know. But, and hope that he doesn't shoot you with a twenty two. Because it'll have enough power to get in and not enough power to get out of your skull. And it'll ricochet around until it slices your brain up. If he shoots you with something like a forty-four, then it's, it may go all the way through your skull, leaving a hole in the front and a hole in the back. And they may cork the front, cork the back, and send you home from the hospital. Okay, okay, maybe it's not quite that simple. But even so. Uh, so as you go into 22, you think about that bank robber shooting you in the head with the 22 because you say that you're not going to obey him because he's being mean. See how that, see how far that gets you and then apply that to God being hard and think, you know, on judgment day, God's not just going to have a 22. He might have a 22 million volt lightning bolt for your eyes, for your uh, ass. Okay. So, uh, there you go. But anyway, um, there's very little here that I haven't already covered. But, but um, so in the previous video, and this video is even longer than the one from yesterday, but I did mention a certain woman named Nakia who heard me speaking with several other men at a table some years ago. She was standing up. Uh, not too far from the table, and these other guys and I were having a boisterous but friendly uh, conversation about religion, and she made the statement that you all take your religion, uh, take, take the scriptures too seriously, too literally. And uh, that actually failed to take into account that people are very serious about their religion. We don't see it as a fairy tale. If you're an atheist, you might see it as a fairy tale. But uh, people who are religious don't see their religion as a fairy tale. You know, and so that is actually quite ignorant and disrespectful to say to people who uh, hold their religion dear. So, anyway, somebody who responded to uh, what I said in that video from yesterday was like, you know... So because of what one woman said, you're now against all atheists? Well, no. But the main reason is to give honor to God because I think about how God feels. And uh, so that's the main reason, okay? 
she was just one example of an ignorant atheist, okay? I mean, I, I would have to guess she's an atheist, and she didn't tell me she's an atheist. But uh, based on, on that one statement from her, it's, it's very possible that she's an atheist. But, but uh, let me see. And I've actually said almost everything without even looking at the notes, even though this video is longer than yesterday's. Uh, and it looks like I actually did cover everything. So you know what? I'm going to sign off. And I sure hope that the woman uh, whose conversation with me I referenced actually sees this. But it's over 40 minutes right now. And I don't know if she's going to choose to watch the whole thing. So I'm going to go back and... Uh, see where I first began to mention her. I think it's at around 11 minutes. Okay. Signing off. Full stop. Mm -hmm.